I'll now call to order the regular meeting of the uh, Board of Trustees of the Texas South Post College uh, District. Trust trustees present tonight are Mr. Eduardo Campidano, Mr. Chester Gonzalez, uh, Mrs. Adela Garza has, has uh, called me and she's feeling a little under the weather, so she's, she will be abs excused absent tonight. Uh, Dr. Roberto Robles, Mr. Rene Torres, and uh, Ms. Rosemary Breedlove. Also present is Dr. Julian Garcia. At this time, I'll ask uh, Dr. Garcia if there are any announcements. No? There are no announcements. Good. Uh, our next item is we have is a board briefing, and I'll call on Dac Dr. Allen Artebeast, our provost, to make the presentation. Someone needs to start me out right here. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, President Garcia, it's uh, with great pleasure I present to you some work that's been ongoing since late last uh, fall. Interestingly, today, uh, an email that President Garcia received was shared with us, just to put uh, this in context. Uh, it was a report from uh, Barry McGee of the system about some hearings that were going on in Austin, Austin today. There is no mic here. Where did the mic go? Oh, it is there. Okay, sorry. And uh, the gist of the report that was made to the one of the legislative committees today was that although all of us are seeing around the country, and especially in Texas, some signs of recovery, the prediction was that the state is still facing over the next two years deficits take your pick in the order of 10 to 20 billion dollars. So uh, lest anyone think we do not need to stay conscious about resource generation and cost containment, I think the message today was that we do. So this is uh, just an update on uh, where we are. Well, okay, I'll use that. So in December, I created, with the assistance of the Business Affairs Office, uh, a task force to look at both sides of the equation, resource generation and cost containment. And it was meant to be a comprehensive review of all activities at our institution. And we involved uh, people from across the institution with a kickoff meeting on December 8th where we got together and I made a presentation, the president made a presentation, and we talked about how we expected this work to move forward. More than 100 faculty, staff, and administration were involved in the various working groups that we created. And I must say that I was uh, delighted by the enthusiasm which people uh, took on this task. And I think that was in part because when we deal with people who are on the front line of an institution, they know by working there on a day-to-day -day basis where we can do things better, more efficiently, more effectively, and even where we might be able to generate new resources for the institution. So we broke the uh, task force up into 15 working groups, and they in turn created a number of subgroups. but. This is just a list of the various areas that we were looking at. As you can see, it is very uh, comprehensive, uh, ranging from uh, administrative uh, and staff salaries and workloads, faculty salaries and workloads, educational services, facilities, technology, looking at our software, looking at our office expenses, our lab supplies and equipment, even uh, the resources that we expend on food and promotional activities. So the work of the task force then got underway and I had asked them to report back to me by February 15th of this year. It was a very tight timeline, but I think most of us know when you're given a task, it's better to be given a hard and fast deadline and you fit the, your work into that time frame. The work that we did, we gave the uh, instructions to the groups that this should be data driven. You should look at uh, the data that is available and the business office and other groups in campus were very helpful in providing the data we needed. We should also talk to those outside the various working groups, focus groups, 
surveying staff and faculty and others. <clears throat> we should look at other institutions since benchmarking is always a very useful way to find out how other institutions are doing things and how we compare with their costs and uh, resource generation. We also uh, looked at best practices. As all of you know in your various uh, occupations, most times you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Someone has already tackled this problem somewhere and we can learn from what they are doing. We created a SharePoint site, not only for members of the task force and working groups, but for anyone on campus who wanted to uh, get on and find out how the work of the groups were going. You could send messages to each other. We put documents on there about what was happening across the state and nationally to give people a context for the work that they were doing. And we also created a virtual suggestion box, which to our pleasant surprise yielded many suggestions uh, anonymously and uh, with names on them from across campus. Because you know the old concept of having a suggestion box, you wonder if anyone took it seriously. Well, people here did take it seriously, and we have some very good ideas that we're working through from that exercise. So given the deadline of February 15th, on the 18th, we all got together in Salon Cassia, and we heard from representatives from each of the working groups. Uh, it was a very uh, interesting meeting. Everyone who served on the task force and others who were interested in this work attended. And uh, that is where we learned what they were recommending to us. So what I'm going to do now is just give you some examples from many of the recommendations that came out of uh, the task force. One was to standard, standardize computer purchases. So. We have, generally speaking, when we needed new computers, went out and bought new computers without checking with the potential user of that computer, what are your needs? Because everybody does not have the same need for the same kind of hardware or software. And simply by uh, looking and doing surveys and checking with staff and others, we discovered that over 80% of our users, users only need a standard model. So we were buying more power and more software than they needed to do their job. You're buying a Cadillac when you need a Volkswagen. That's right. <laughs> Many of them are like me. I use email and the internet, and that's about it on my computer. I don't need a lot of uh, the software program. So the estimate is that if we implement this, we can avoid or save in the neighborhood of $370,000. Similarly, you know, we've all gotten the habit that when we get a computer, we all want our own printer. Even if there's 10 of us in the office or 15 in the office, we all want the printer sitting right on our desk. And there's no uh, necessity for that. You can have, in most operational units, a centralized computer, which means maintenance costs, purchase costs, supply costs all go down because they can be used in that centralized uh, fashion. And as well, for those of you who have dealt with printer issues, as I'm dealing with my printer at home, there are so many models out there these days with different kinds of toners and equipment and so forth. So by standardizing and streamlining, we estimated that we could save close to $300,000 across campus. Another uh, almost no-brainer, but one that you need to really focus your uh, attention to to realize the cost savings we're estimating here is to uh, come to grips with automatic systems and training our staff and personnel to turn off lights when they leave offices to watch the heat or air conditioning I'm hopeful we'll move to a situation and I lived in a very warm climate where I came from at Arizona State the warmest it got in winter was 68, and the coolest it got in the summer was 78. And it's amazing how you adjust to that after a while. You take off your coat in the summer, and you wear a, a sweater in the wintertime. But uh, a basic estimate uh, suggests that we can save close to $200,000 by doing that. On the resource generation side, we really focused in on ways in which we could grow our enrollment. Uh, one of the new things that's happening is financial aid for the first time will now be available during the summer. Our staff are marketing that opportunity and we hope to increase our summer enrollment. And summer enrollment is an opportunity for us to generate uh, significant additional tuition revenue 
that we can utilize to support our uh, academic and technical programs across campus. I appointed an independent uh, faculty committee to look at summer and winter sessions. How could we improve the current way we offer summer courses? And could we add a winter session between the end of fall classes and the beginning of the spring semester? I have that report on my desk now and I'm working with my staff to see what parts of what we could implement immediately and over the next year or two. You'll see some other examples here about delivering virtual ESL courses, uh, particularly to our friends across the border and using our webinar and webcast technologies to deliver outstanding uh, speakers and continuing ed opportunities and uh, professional development uh, points for people in various occupations throughout the region. So where do we go from here? Well, we are evaluating, uh, implementing those recommendations. There were 150 plus recommendations we consolidated them because then as you can imagine many of them touched on the similar areas we consolidated them into 61 recommendations we have a full version of the report and if any board member would like 200 pages of all the recommendations I would happily share that with you I have now tasked the vice presidents of all the divisions uh, after we sorted these through the business affairs office to look at the recommendations that touch on their areas and next week at our Provost Council meeting they will be reporting back on what they uh, are able to do. And we are literally going to keep a scorecard that will show as this mock-up suggests what recommendations we can fully implement, partially implement, where they are in the progress of being implemented because some of these things you cannot literally do overnight but would take time. For example, putting temperature and light controls in buildings will take us a while to do that because we would need to do some installations. And interestingly, given the dedication of the staff and faculty and administration, several of the working groups wanted to continue to do further work in areas that they did not have a chance to investigate uh, to the extent that they hoped they would be able to. So the next stages are to continue to monitor this. We will keep the board informed of what new resources we were able to generate as a result of this exercise and what uh, cost containment or cost avoidance we were able to achieve. So we will keep a running number to see how this will assist us during the difficult times that we probably face in the next biennium in this state and at our institution. I'm happy to answer any questions or to clarify anything that board members may wish to ask. Dr. Artemis, I have a question. <clears throat> I have a couple of teenagers at home that go through a lot of toner. Right. <laughs> and I, I, I want to know how, uh, what, what uh, kind of ideas the people had to reduce toner use. <laughs> well, part of the issue is, for example, uh, without thinking about it, when I came here, I, I got a printer for the computer I have at home. And it's a color printer. I don't need a color printer. So the first thing you need to ask is, how many people need a color printer? I have one in the provost office, it's the main printer. That's all we need, one for six or eight of us. So that's the first question you need to ask. The second is to standardize models. This printer I have at home has five different cartridges, <laughs> rather than just one black and white cartridge that could save a, a lot of money. So, even in, I don't know how many printers you have at home, Dr. Robles, but standardizing them at home is the same concept. But, but actually, you know, and, and you know, I think the savings was going to be close to 300,000 right. printers and all that. And, and I read some some other business that was that it, you know, it had lots of computers. And one of the things they did is that there's apparently now printers that uh, where you can refill your own ink and stuff. And I mean, they, they, it's it's a right. I think there it's are, become a hot yeah. item. And so this. This business was just, you know, they had, the, they were doing all their own refilling and they saved an inordinate amount of money. It was over $100,000 a year just from being able to refill. No, I, I've also, read that also, too. Some of them have the St. Joseph's uh, yeah. toner. Right. No, <laughs> and also yeah, some yeah, of them yeah. have accelerated uh, warning customers. Right. So they start telling you when they're starting to run out. And so what that does essentially is it gets you to order ahead of you need right. to. And some of them actually don't 
let you go all the way to where you actually are using use it all up. Percent of it that they start to go out crap out at you at fifteen percent or stuff. Like well, that. one so trick I I learned at my last institution when my printer started printing unclearly. <laughs> I told my sister I need a new uh, cartridge. She said, no, you don't. She came in, took it out, and shook it. It lasted for another week. So part of it is the kind of models no, we I buy. Like lot, yeah. like, oh, because what a lot of the printing companies have done is give you a very low price for the printer. It's like, it's like $100. Theory. But the toner can be $100 a month. That's so. why they want to hook you into that deal. Right. So. Well, it's good to see that we're implementing all these cost-cutting measures. Now, I'd like also to say thank you very much. Take the bull by the horns. I know this is really difficult, but I believe in standardization. I think more business, more hospitals, more medical, the medical in right. general really ought to be standardizing. Back in the 80s, uh, the anesthesiologist we were having so many deaths in anesthesiology during, you know, right. either bringing them out, take, putting them in, that um, they decided they better look at it and go to the companies that were making their machines. Some were, it, the oxygen was on the left, some was on the right, they were all different colors, and they decided to standardize, and it made a huge difference. Right. They cut it down, they cut it down to like 10%, uh, right. when it was huge before, huge yeah. numbers that were dying. And, you know, we all need to be looking at that. Standardization, you look at everything you pick up as technologically oriented. Right. You have one, on one side will be, you know, the volumes on the right on one side, and, uh, on one instrument, right. and it's on the, right. on the left and the other. So uh, I thank you for doing that. It's a great and idea. And we the, need to be doing I've that. I've always been concerned about the cost of energy on the campus here. I know right. that's getting into PUV. How much do we pay on light bills here? Um, and are there buildings that you just cannot turn off the energy because it's harder to Well, I, get it I've tasked again? the facilities people, and Veronica and Mendes particularly, to do an overview of the entire campus. And part of the challenge with the energy conservation is sometimes you have to invest money to save money, and you have to put that out over time. Certainly in all the new buildings, we've been very conscious of that. But in some of the other buildings, we need to retrofit them and try to move to a, a way we can do central some controls. Some of it is also changing behavior because remember, yes. conservation doesn't cost you anything. That's right. You're absolutely right. Uh, and it's one of the things that we're working on to, I've, I've gotten a habit now when I leave my office, I turn the lights on. Uh, it, it's an easy habit to get into, but unless you're conscious of it, you don't think of it. The other thing we've done starting, uh, I believe we started March 15th, on weekends for classes, we were using five buildings. So we looked at, we've consolidated that to three buildings. So we don't need to turn on all the energy for those extra <coughs> two buildings over the weekend. And we did this in consultation with the faculty and students so they weren't disrupted. But it's kind of a no-brainer when you, after you've done it, but you wonder why, why didn't we think of this before? Um, I have a, a couple of questions that relating to, uh, is, is your faculty workload um, a separate report related to this as far as cost containment is concerned? We, uh, the, the committee that was working on that talked, uh, spent most of the time looking at salary comparisons and so forth. And in the next month or so, I'll be happy to share with the board what our proposals are for the next uh, academic year. The workload issue, we are getting into that now. It's one of the subsequent discussions that is ongoing. And we needed to do a lot of things on the workload side in terms of standardizing things across campus and making sure that uh, faculty understand the equity issue that different colleges aren't doing things different ways and different departments aren't doing things differently. So, so you will have a report on yes. that in the next couple right. of months? Yes. The, the other things that I, that I looked at, you have a savings of about 850000 Right. Um, are you putting that money back into buying software, hardware, or, or, or buying supplies, or what happens to that money, that savings that you that you, uh, that you Well, have here? as you know, uh, we already had to cut our uh, biennium budget by 5%. So part of it's backfilling that cut so that we could still move forward with the salary package for our faculty and staff for next year. We're also hopeful that this will allow us to uh, fill some of the staff positions 
that we've been slow to increase staff in offices like financial aid and student recruitment. Even though our numbers have grown dramatically, our staff has stayed stagnant, and we want to provide some relief to the hardworking employees in those units. I'm sure, I'm, I'm glad to see that, well. that you would do something like that because I, you know, I, I've seen where staff is, is lacking in certain areas, and right. if you said this money to do that, that's something that, uh, right. that is needed. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention, the last thing has to do with uh, um, buying computers for, for the labs that, that we have for our students. Right. And then we make sure that we're consistent in upgrading those computers right. with it in a timely basis. Right. And that they're not working with a computer. Might not be a new computer, but as long as you upgrade the computer. Right. And keep the software operating appropriately. Absolutely. Okay. Well, if you're looking at the numbers that you just quoted, I suspect that most of your is going to be backfilling. Right. There yeah. isn't going to be much left over. Of any. Be, yeah. You still need to go forward if you're just looking. Right. What was it, a 5% cut? Right. Look at the budget. You're not even close to that. Right. And that's why the other side of the equation is equally critical, the resource generation. Right. We need to uh, keep our eye on that side of the ledger because it is uh, often more creative and uh, exciting to find new ways to generate additional revenue using uh, similar resources or even if you need to invest more. And I can give you one example. So Dean Gwenda came to me to talk about a grant that they'd have to hire an outreach <coughs> coordinator for their bass and bat programs. And he has made, uh, through his college and that outreach coordinator, linkages with some uh, 800 uh, other institutions around the state and around the country. And we are able to offer those programs largely online. And he made the case to me, and uh, together with Vice President Dameron, we reviewed his data. And it showed by investing $60,000 in a position, we would make more than that back by increased tuition revenue and uh, more students. So we always have to keep our mind uh, on that fact that uh, I like to say, don't come to me and ask me for money. Come to me and make an investment proposal to me. If you spend this money, this is what will happen, and it will make us a better place as a result. Part of this, at one time, you also were looking at assets and whether or not we had a discussion about shedding assets. Yes, and in fact, uh, through the Physical Facilities Committee, we've been working with uh, Veronica Mendez and the President. <coughs> And we will be bringing back to the board in the near future, either in April or May, some suggestions about uh, how we might look at the assets. We call them ancillary properties and enterprises, because it's both properties and also some of the businesses we have here on campus, and whether we're managing them in the most effective way possible. So that was one of the committee reports that is in, in the package. And it's a longer term thing. And we need to review as a, as a board and a physical facilities committee each of the properties and look at all of them have a history around them, how we ended up with these properties. But the fact is many of them, uh, as valuable as, as they are in the abstract, cost us money to maintain. And we need to find ways to either use them more effectively, to lease them, or perhaps to shed them. Those are difficult and longer term decisions. Thank you, Dr. Ardvis. Thank you. We will now, uh, board will now convene an executive <laughs> session as provided by the government code, and we'll be back shortly. <laughs>
this the uh, resolution. Oh, this is a resolution. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me get to that. Okay. This is uh, uh, by way of background. This is the uh, I guess resolution that we've been working on for a while, and I think as a result of uh, all our efforts of the uh, meeting with the community advisory committee and and. Uh, discussing all the things I think that we need uh, to incorporate uh, into this agreement. It's been looked at, I think, by all the board members. Everybody's yeah. added their input. And uh, this is something we've been working on, I guess, for, oh, good, every bit of six months now, maybe even a little bit longer. And uh, I think this is the, the result of, of all that hard work. And uh, it's been, I think, uh, scrutinized by everybody, by staff and by, uh, by all the board members. and. I guess uh, we can, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, ask for any discussion at this time. And, and no. Mr. Chairman, uh, the resolution is for supporting a new model for the partnership agreement. And I know we've had a lot of discussions about that. And I think that, you know, in the end, what we're doing by this resolution is, is simply stating to the UT system and the Board of Regents that we are going to do our best, put our best foot forward, commit the resources that we need through our staff and everyone else, is to come up with a new partnership model. The partnership that we've had has served this institution well, uh, but it's also 20 years old. And you know, a lot of the discussions we've been in there about what are the critical core values of the junior college mission or the community college, wh what are the, 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 the values of, of the university system, and somehow or other, I think we all agree that it has worked well, but there are things that need to be addressed. And I think, you know, as the board and, and the working team and everybody goes forward to work out the details, we're not gonna resolve those here and now, but what I think what we are doing is certainly putting our best foot forward and, and sending a clear message to what the regents have already done and to the chancellor to UT system that we agree to work together to come up with a best model that will serve the purposes of Texas Southmost College <coughs> while at the same time preserving what has been the good things about the partnership with the University of Texas system. And that has brought a lot of benefits to our students in terms of expanded opportunities, uh, academic opportunities, you know, those go right in line with uh, employment opportunities. So, uh, you know, we, 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 we've had this before us, so we've discussed it publicly numerous times, uh, and, and I think it's time for us to certainly demonstrate to the regents that, that we are more than willing to, to meet them in this effort to attempt to define what that new model for this institution will be in the future. It's well, well said, Mr. Capitano, and, and I think uh, this resolution that d does signal our intent to the regents that we we uh, want to continue working with them, and, and and also by way of background that you know staff uh, from both uh, our campus and from <coughs> UT Systems has met you know diligently uh, and for many hours over the the last uh, six to nine months to to forge a new agreement. And this resolution, I just you know signals our intent to to continue working. Uh, uh, on uh, uh, solidifying that agreement. Well, even though the resolution will appear later on our agenda, but nonetheless, that's what the basis of the discussion has been for moving forward with the UT system on the, on the partnership issue. Well, at, at, at this point, Uh, uh, and, and actually, I was going to, but I thought you know we had uh, also a little later in the agenda the, the report of the community advisory committee meetings that we had, and it makes more sense to do it now because uh, the purpose of those meetings, as you know, was that to get the community's input on the on the partnership agreement. And so, uh, I Can think uh, if, if it's okay with you all, I'd, I'd like to go into that report at this and time. You, and you make well make items five and six together. What's that? Take items five and six together. Correct. Yes, Mr. Torres. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't there a um, an attachment to this resolution relating to the principles, um, the the seven or eight major principles relating to the resolution? They're not, or is it not in the package? No. No. Not that I'm aware of. I know that when when the UT system passed the resolution, there was an attachment uh, relating to the principles. Um, uh, the, the seven or eight major principles re related to the resolution. 
are you talking about seven or eight major principles that they came up with or that well, we had asked the for? ones that, that we had yeah we had we had if you recall yeah. that there yeah. was and it makes reference to the, the, the issues that we start off in our early discussions, discussions. which are somewhat summarized already in the community report summarized. and some of the other things but it, it did it, you know the, you know we, we said that there were certain things that were really critical to that and and, and, and that may form the, the guiding principles, but by no means is it going to form everything that we're going to potentially come up with. But, but there was an attachment to that initially. And, but my understanding is that uh, basically this resolution is just to go ahead and uh, let them know that we want to move forward in uh, redoing the, the uh, partnership agreement. Yeah, it's not, bi it's not binding. All it it's is, binding. It, it's, it's a yeah. symbolic. No, just, no. I just, just wanted to make sure that, that, just a resolution. Um, that we had a we did get a copy of those uh, of those uh, principles, and I think it's important. No, it is, and that's what we came up with. That's, that's part of this package, as far as sure. the, the eight or nine principles I think that were listed is related to the, <coughs> the resolution. Absolutely. And, and as you recall, at the end of, of the, of the uh, document, it says that the new model is subject to approval of, by this board. By, by this board. So all that, all those, those, those principles are definitely be obviously included in any new agreement that we, 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 we adopt. And as, as we move forward, then, then we'll have the details of those eight or nine principles that were listed. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Uh, so <clears throat> let me follow up then. And, and the community advisory committee, as you all know, met on February 10th, 16th, and 23rd of this year. And the committee was established to provide a unique opportunity for different members of the community uh, uh, to look at, at the partnership agreement and, and to help us prepare for an expanded uh, higher education opportunities in Brownsville. The uh, uh, purposes of the meetings was, was to get the input from all these, these members that we invited. And we try to invite, I think we were very careful and, and, and I compliment the trustees on uh, submitting names from all you know, different uh, sectors of the community. I mean, we had, uh, the clergy, we had bankers, we had teachers, we had uh, students, uh, and uh, I mean, I think staff, faculty, and staff, and we, you know, we asked for everybody's input, and, and the meetings, you know, were, uh, I think, very open. You know, we sent a lot of material to the committee members uh, during uh, the, the different meetings, between the different meetings, and uh, so that they could you know, make more informed decisions and and I think we had a lot of there was a lot of spirited discussion and and a lot of good input uh, from the community and uh, one of the uh, uh, you know the one thing I, I think the things that that were some of the things that were uh, were stressed uh, were are, are some of these you know seven principles uh, what we talked about was open admissions affordability TSC's role in community college offerings and uh, commitment also to the community. And uh, at the second meeting, we uh, uh, <coughs> we talked about TSC board uh, governance over tax rates, uh, collections and its use, uses, as well as clarity in the respect to board roles and uh, shared uh, particip participatory academic government governance. And uh, the the. Uh, the third concept was increasing resources to a sustained level for future funding that enables the special needs of this area. And finally, the, not, no, not finally, the fourth concept was to, to strive for higher completion rates uh, by developing mentoring and retention programs, because that's, that's a problem that all community colleges and community universities like ours face. And the fifth was uh, concerning the needs to provide a focus on high real world job skills and learning and to be able to provide the need for ongoing pro programs to meet the new job needs. Uh, there were lots of other issues discussed. Uh, uh, the need for a community university to provide high quality programs, uh, to focus on teaching, to be efficient and transparent, and uh, to provide a living wage policy for all employees, uh, to increase our technology, and uh, to take advantage of, uh, of uh, all the things that uh, UT Systems offers. and, and uh, all the things that they can help us with, uh, including uh, uh, external funding uh, to help us expand our institutional development uh, uh, department and, and continue raising uh, more money uh, for the university in these uh, tough economic times. So, uh, overall, the, the meetings were important to get valuable insight and, and, and input from the community. And, and, and one of the reasons this came about is 
you know, 20 years ago, was it 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, when we started all this, we had community input and, and, and had a couple of original members from that uh, committee, Ray Garza and, and, and several others, I think, that, that were on that committee. And, and, and they gave us valuable insight back then, and, and I think we got a lot of valuable uh, input and, and uh, a lot of things were raised that we will make sure are incorporated into any uh, partnership agreement that uh, is finalized. Any yes, comments? Or? Yeah. Do we yeah. Accept the resolution. I would, I, I would entertain. Uh, if there's not any more discussion, I would entertain a motion at this time to uh, so move. To, uh, to, for passage of the resolution. It's been moved by Dr. Robles, seconded by Ms. Breedlove. Uh, to uh, pass the uh, resolution supporting a new model for the partnership agreement. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And I guess at this time, uh, do you want, would you all like me to read it into the record, or uh, uh, do we need to? That's necessary. It's I a long one. It's pretty lengthy. I, don't, I think it's up to you. It's yeah, I, think you I think we probably we need to. I mean, it's a, histor it's a historic resolution, so I probably should read. I read it fast. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas higher education opportunity has been an ambition for the people of Deep South Texas for generations, inspiring them to establish Texas' first accredited junior college in Brownsville in 1926, and whereas approximately every 20 years since the community has refined its vision for higher education, and whereas the most recent refinement has been the partnership between Texas Apples College and the University of Texas system and the creation of the University of Texas at Brownsville, and whereas just as higher education was first established in our community to meet the needs of the 20th century, we are now committed to addressing the challenges and opportunities of the 21st century, and we believe that those needs cannot be fully met with traditional higher education models. And whereas there is a need for a new model that will preserve and advance the values and mission of the community college and university in a single higher education educational institution, particularly focused on meeting the higher education needs and circumstances of the Rio Grande Valley, and whereas the board recognizes that over the past 20 years, the unique education collaboration be between Texas Southwest College and the University of Texas system has produced important educational achievements. And whereas the Texas Southwest College Board of Trustees has explored issues affecting a new partnership model through discussions with a task force comprised of senior representatives of UTB, TSC, and through a series of meetings with more than 30 community leaders. And whereas the UTB, TSC task force has met with counterparts on behalf of UT systems for discussions relating to the enhancement of the partnership, and whereas the board confirms its commitment to these basic values and principles set forth by the task force in the attached statement of concepts and principles and understands the importance of seeking a more efficient, effective model of collaboration to fully realize the challenges in higher education in the coming years, and whereas the board agrees with and accepts the recommendation of the task force to pursue a new partnership organization that is fully recognized in law to have all the power and authority to act as a single entity in the best interest of UTB TSC uh, consolidated mission, meeting the legal requirements of both entities to provide high quality education programs at the certificate community college undergraduate and graduate levels. And whereas the Board of Regents of UT Systems, by resolution adopted March 3rd, 2010, also accepted the recommendation of the task force and authorized senior administrators with UT Systems to proceed and carry out the recommendations of the task force. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the TSC Board of Trustees joins the UT System Board of Regents in all efforts to seek appropriate legislative endorsement of this new partnership model and direct its representatives to take all legal and statutory steps toward the development of a new partnership model and agreement to present it to the Board of Trustees for approval in the upcoming year. Uh, and that be passed and adopted today. I'd like to, I don't know if you mentioned it or not, but, but for the audience at home and the, the audience that are here, that, that we did meet with uh, the chancellor and the vice chancellor and, and uh, legal counsel from the UT system, and mo most of us were, were there. Uh, this was a face-to-face -face meeting that, um, that was, uh, I think, um, very important for us. It's at least very important for me because this is the first time that I, that I had met with the UT system people. And, um, at the end of the meeting, I, I felt very comfortable um, on their commitment on, uh, as far as creating a, a, a more harmonious uh, partnership in the future. And um, I certainly felt the, the, the commitment from them, and uh, I felt very comfortable with, with the chancellor and the vice chancellor. Uh, and, I, and I feel that um, 
they are uh, very serious about taking us to the next level and, and helping us in the future, uh, more so than it's been done in the past. Um, and I, I felt uh, very good about their support at that time, and hopefully that will carry on uh, in, in the future. And I think it's important for the people here and the people at home that, to, to know that um, uh, I felt a, a very deep commitment from them at, the, at, at that meeting. Now, the, the, the level of commitment I think we've gotten both from the chancellor and staff is unparalleled in my 16 years on the board. And, uh, and you know, there, there clearly is uh, a strong desire by, by the chancellor and this administration, and I believe by the Board of Regents as well, to, to help us, you know, uh, you know uh, obtain more funding and help us, you know, uh, grow into the community com university that this, this community deserves. And uh, for the record, also, Mrs. I spoke with Mrs. Garza uh, about the resolution, and, and she was all in favor of it too. And, and told me if she'd been here today, she would, uh, she would, uh, she approves of it, and, and uh, uh, strongly recommends, you know, approval. So uh, it would, it was unanimous, and it would have been unanimous had she been here too. Okay, we'll move on to the. Uh, I'm sorry, we also have something on the one man under change order. Is he outside? Okay. We, we, did, we voted already. I was unanimous, correct? Yes. Yeah, we did. We did it before the resolution. So. Okay. Yes, the. Rec uh, I'm trying to remember where. We go back to legal matters under uh, change order. And yeah, that's right. Documents. Correct. Uh, the, 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 the last uh, item we had out of executive session involves a change order, and I'll entertain a motion from uh, Mr. Campidano at this time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we authorize council to negotiate a settlement agreement uh, within the parameters discussed in executive session and to authorize staff to carry out uh, the agreement once accepted. It's been moved by Mr. Capitano. Is there a second? Aye. Seconded by Ms. Breedla. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Sure, I got through all these other ones. Resolution, okay. Uh, next item on our agenda is the speakers to agenda items and public discussion. No speakers. Uh, the uh, item number eight is approval of minutes of the previous meeting. Is Move everybody? To approve. Second. Okay. Moved by Mr. Capitano, seconded by uh, uh, Mr. Gonzalez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. This time I'll call on Dr. Ruth Ann Raglan to report on the next item of the agenda, which is the Art Center balcony seating. Mr. Chairman, board members, and Dr. Garcia. Our new Art Center is complete, and we've had our first inaugural year performance with a night of strings. It was a wonderful evening to celebrate. We celebrated our new building. <coughs> we celebrated our current students and our future students. These, all of these students will have their lives changed through the opportunities offered by this fabulous new venue. It really looks nice in the dark it's too, beautiful. doesn't it? It's just beautiful. It's like a, yeah. We in Institutional Advancement came to you more than two years ago to seek your approval for naming opportunities for interior spaces so that we could present them to potential donors. We've reflected those spaces in the visuals used in all of our marketing materials. This is the balcony seating visual that we've been using to date. And as you can see in this diagram, it did not appear that the two boxes closest to the stage on both sides would be finished out for seating. However, now that the building is complete and we have held a major event in it, we've made a wonderful discovery. We actually have two additional boxes on the balcony level that were not presented for naming opportunities over two years ago. However, those two boxes <coughs> comfortably seat four people each. These boxes are known in performance hall parlance as Juliet boxes because the opera in, in the opera, Juliet stands in one of the boxes and Romeo sings to her from the stage. One box already has been selected by a generous donor and named. This revised visual shows 11 boxes as J through T. You will note that the three balcony boxes at the center back are labeled N, O, and P. 
The center box O will hold six chairs, and the two flanking boxes N and P will hold three chairs each. The combination of the three boxes will provide excellent seating for 12 guests. We would like to present two options for naming the boxes in this area. The first option for naming would be to group them together and require a gift of $150,000 for naming them. The second option would be for each of the three boxes to, name, to be named separately. If a patron wishes to name only the six seat box in the center, O, the naming would require $100,000. If a patron wishes to name only one three seat box, the naming would be for 50,000 each, two, two boxes for 50,000 each. These boxes are prime locations in our new Performing Arts Center, and they will offer an excellent view of the stage and the performance hall, and they really are wonderful seats. We also have another recommendation that we would like to make, uh, and that is that you retain one box in the balcony for UTBTSC guest purposes and that you name it. If the box is not being used for special guests, then the tickets to the seats could be sold. We believe that it would be very beneficial for UTBTSC to retain a box for special use for guests and to name it. I have a, a little slide of summer, a summary of our recommendations to you. One is that you revise the naming opportunities for the 12 seats in the balcony back center box area. Option one being one 12 seat box NOP for $150,000. If named separately, the six seat box would be named, the center one O uh, would be named at 100,000 and the two three seat boxes at 50,000 each. And two, that you would designate a balcony box for special UTBTSC use and name the box. Uh, both of these would require board action. Ruthann, can you go back to the configuration of the whole? Now, when you talk about, when you say the, the last recommendation, you're talking about either J or T? It would be, it would be K, L, M, uh, uh, T, R, T, S, R. So you, you want one of those boxes and are Q. for TSC purposes? Right, right. Oh, okay. Okay, well, you lost me there. You said KLM. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, J, J has already been named. Oh, right. Okay, okay. so it's KLM or QRST. K is taken too. Oh, it's K taken also. <laughs> oh, very good. Very good. You know what, you better, you're about to get my mom really mad at me. You're that offering that her box Wonderful. away. <laughs> yeah, we actually made the decision. I hadn't talked to you, but that's the Wonderful. Box Thank now, you. M, M and Q. Are, are uh, have three seats versus the others. Okay, M and Q are special situations. M and Q each could hold uh, up to six or wheelchairs. Now we must we must must maintain the ADA requirements. So if we use one of those for six boxes, uh, I mean six seats, then the other would need to be used all for wheelchairs. We do have a potential donor for one of those boxes already. The other would be for wheelchairs. So then that would limit you, if you want to preserve that option and stay in compliance with ADA and all that, you, you have L, R, S, or T. Yes. Mm -hmm. All of which are wonderful boxes. I've, I've gone and stood in each one of them, and they each have different uh, feelings as you look out on the stage and on the audience. Roberto, you want to pick one? <laughs> I think, no, David, I think already told me he wants to take uh, P, O, and N for $150,000. <laughs> hey. I'm sorry, David, but you uh, beat me to it. The only ones making <laughs> money these <laughs> days are doctors, and everybody knows that. So. They're, they're going to be making more money. Yeah, I got a full insurance coverage now. <laughs> No, Dr. Dr. Robles, for the record, has been very generous and had a, 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 a teaching studio named and also has been instrumental in, in securing other other contributions so we appreciate that and it, so it inspired me to do one as well Dr. Yeah, is that right. art for thank Rosemary? you David. Okay, fine. so is what well as I understand so what is it that you're that you're uh, 
recommending that for the, the trustees' box. Okay. Will be sold if it's call it TSC box. TSC box. box. No, that sounds wrong. A scorpion box. Yeah, there you go. Scorpion. And that one, and that would be which one though? R. 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 Okay. Can you? I'm sorry. Yeah. Can, can, yeah. Let me see that. I lost it on my screen. Okay. There we go. Well, but the, wouldn't it make more sense if you, if you had the potential to use six seats in Q or an M versus four seats? <laughs> Say that. I mean, if it was a UTV TSE, you get three and three, you know, three no. from UTB and three from TSE. Wait, is it, this is a TSC building. Uh, okay. okay. So, so make it all. If, six, if they want to give us a box at the drum in Austin, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in exchange, that would be fine. In but, exchange, uh, uh, Rosa, you want to put that for a motion? Or second? Well, if we have to address both of them, but I'll make uh, well, a motion that we, that TSC takes uh, box number R, letter R, and we call it the Scorpion box. I'll second. So there's a motion by Ms. Breedlove and uh, <coughs> second by Mr. Capitano to designate uh, the uh, R box as a scorpion box uh, for use uh, uh, by the trustees for so special guests. No, by the 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 for use by the University College yeah, uh, no, for special yeah, guests. No, this is an I, I'm sorry, I, yeah, yeah. No, it's, not, it's not a trustees box. And for the other one, may we say then that if we can uh, if someone wants the 12, do we? How do we want to? Well, let's just do. Let's that, let's handle this motion first, the naming of the, okay. uh, or the, just, okay. and then we'll we'll get into that one. So there's there's a there's a motion by Miss Breedlove. There's a motion by Miss Breedlove and a second uh, uh, by Mr. Campidano uh, that we designate uh, uh, our box uh, as uh, uh, scorpion, scorpion box, box for special guests. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Now, as I understand, on the other issue, yeah, we can agree to both option one and two, correct? Yes, that's right. That's what yeah. And that would allow us some flexibility the there. Flexibility. Yeah. So that way we can we no, can. I make uh, a motion that we do uh, option number one, which was we could do one or A or B. Yes. Okay. Someone second that. So, so back to option one. Yeah. One or two. Either so we're clear that option other. one is, is that? We, no. Whichever sells. Option one was 1250 per seat. For what, what it would allow us is to give a donor an option. How Say, do you want if you want to buy all 12, here's what it would right. cost you. Right. If you want to buy only six in the middle, it'll cost you this or three right. and three. Right. So and that way, we, the donor has an option already approved by you. But you're not going to sell them as individual seats if you only had one donor. No, right. sir. Yeah. Th th these are boxes. You have to sell them as a box. So, yeah. so the box could be a box of three. Correct. A box of six or a box of 12. Yes. That's like yes. a quinella. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's no, it's what it not. Is, that is. <laughs> Whatever that is. <laughs> so it's option I'll second, two. Uh, option Ms. two. Breed loves, uh, on when place or show. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'll second Ms. Breedlove's uh, Okay. It's a motion by uh, yes. Ms. Breedlove, seconded by Dr. Robles to approve of option uh, one, correct? No, 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 no I'm sorry. To approve of, of uh, option two. No, option no, it's not option two. two. It's, it's actually right. item one. It was not, it was yes. That's right. yeah. Item one. It, it is to name the center balcony boxes. Correct. Two. With, with the two options that are presented, option one and two. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is a report from the Physical Facilities Committee meeting, and I'll call on uh, Chester Gonzalez at this time to make the report. And let's see. Physical facilities or? Oh, second day. Let me find it here. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, PFC committee met on Tuesday, March 25th. President were uh, our chairman, David Oliveira, Ms. Rosemary Breedlove, Mr. René Torres, Dr. Julia V. Garcia, Dr. Alan Artebis, Dr. Wayne Moore, Veronica Mendes, and myself. The meeting began with an overview of the Athletic Zone Master Plan as well as Campus Connections. <coughs> we proceeded to tour several construction sites and existing facilities in the mud 
Uh, Ms. Mendez took us on a tour of the Oliveira Library, the Garrison Gym, the Science Technology Learning Center, and the Athletic Zone, and the Art Center. The tour and discussions along the way were very engaging, and the committee did not get to discuss the action items that are before us today. I'd like to now at this time introduce Ms. Mendez to Assistant VP for Planning and Construction to present these items. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. I hope you enjoyed the slideshow. We did. <laughs> First item for your consideration is the campus roof repairs for the uh, roofs over M1 <laughs> and the Cortez building. Uh, we went out for uh, requested bids and we received four responses. And the recommended proposal includes uh, about uh, 6,000 square feet of repair over M1 and the Cortez building. We are recommending that you take the lowest uh, proposal in, in terms of cost for $231,495 to American Contracting. Uh, that is, American Contracting is a company that is very reputable and that has done work with us over at ITEC and various campus buildings. So this will require a motion. So uh, the committee recommends, and I move to accept the proposal from American Contracting USA, the proof repairs project in the amount of 231495 and to authorize the assistant VP for planning construction to execute the contract. Second. I second it. Motion by uh, Mr. Gonzalez, seconded by Mr. Torres. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. The next item for your consideration is renovation of the Raul Guerra Early Childhood Center. As, as the children move to the new facility of the Center for Early Childhood Studies, there are some spaces that were vacated in the Raul Guerra Center that we would like to renovate uh, as, as we don't have uh, babies there right now. So um, we will be doing some additional changing of the BCT tile, placing some of the view windows that we do for observation. Uh, in the doors, we would also be adding, be adding a viewing panel, change the restrooms because the regular height into uh, kitty size like you've seen in the new facility <coughs> and the proposal that we received is from one of the procurement companies the tips company uh, called the John Wyant company and it's a company from San Benito and the cost per square foot for this uh, renovation is thirty seven dollars and thirty nine cents which is very comparable to what you have done at the iTech for example is forty dollars a square foot the contract amount is fifty-nine thousand eight hundred and twenty-five and thirty-six cents, and we recommend uh, that you uh, pass the motion. Then the committee recommends that I move to award the bid for modification in the Raul J. Guerra Early Child Care Center to the John White Company in the amount of fifty-nine thousand eight hundred twenty-five dollars and thirty-six cents, and to authorize Assistant VP for plan construction to execute said contract. Right. Sir, second. second. Uh, moved by Mr. Gonzalez seconded by Ms. Breedlove. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion, uh, opposed? Motion carries. Because of the tour, M Mr. Chairman, uh, other items on the agenda will be discussed at the next uh, meeting of the PFC committee, which will include a tour of the baseball facilities. Uh, the, the tour of the, the, the new athletic zone was very impressive. And uh, uh, the fact that it's going to be ready by September is amazing to me. And. Uh, I guess Bill Peacock is, is working on that, and, and look, we're looking anxiously looking forward to the opening you know, of this field. So. Uh, the East Loop, yeah. How smart you are. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, and, and you know, the, the, our, as much as our, as our soccer program has, uh, you know, with as much as they've accomplished in the teams, uh, this will be a nice, I think, reward for them in the beginning, you know, I think of uh, much more uh, to come for them. So it's exciting. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the uh, Business Affairs Partnership Committee, and I'll call on Ms. Rosemary Martinez, Vice President for Business Affairs, to make the report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Business Affairs Partnership Committee met on Monday, March 22nd and discussed the following items. Beginning with uh, the first item, consideration and possible action on approval of budget amendments for fiscal year 2010. 
Budget Amendment 10-002, which is contained within your uh, packets, adjust expenditures in the general fund to increase the dues and memberships line for the, <coughs> excuse me, membership to the Brownsville Comprehensive Plan Coordinating Board. Budget Amendment 10-003 is to roll over funds from fiscal year 2009 into the Campus Facilities Fund for the fer uh, Perimeter Fence Project. Uh, this is just a, a <coughs> excuse me, a timing budget amendment and it's just a uh, moving uh, budget that was not used in 2009 to 2010 to finish that up. So the committee recommends approving budget amendments 10-002 and 10-003 for fiscal year 2010 as presented. And Mr. Chairman, this item requires uh, a motion and approval by the board. Motion to approve. Second. There's a motion by, been moved by Mr. Capitano, seconded by Mr. Gonzalez to approve the budget amendment. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. The second item was to consider possible action on acceptance of a grant award and approval to proceed with the grant implementation on grant from the Texas Workforce Commission received in the amount of $203,000. Uh, the grant will fund development of new curriculum and will enhance existing curriculum in four tracks, which are wind energy technology, uh, solar, uh, solar photovoltaic technology, solar thermal technology, and green building technology. This was a grant that was applied for and actually awarded uh, through uh, Irv Downing's group uh, and Jim Holt's group uh, out at ITEC. And so the committee recommends accepting the grant from the Texas Workforce Commission in the amount of $203,000 and authorizing the transfer of the grant to UTBTSC for implementation. This item requires a motion, Mr. Chairman. I have a question on that. Um, I think, um, was this grant applied through TSC or, or through UTB? Uh, it, I, I know that I talked to you yes. about this. It was Eric, a can you explain that to me, on how this worked out? <coughs> How it relates to the uh, to the um, policy manual? Yeah, and, and uh, this this grant was applied for as TSC because that is community colleges are who is eligible to apply for this grant and and the, and the second grant we'll talk about tonight. And the way the policy is written currently, uh, we are to bring an application to you before before we apply for a grant if it's only to be a TSC grant. We saw some issues with that in, in uh, the audit findings that we had with the Skill Development Fund. And uh, so that is the reason that it's for you tonight, is because typically we would now, if we have a TSC grant, the way the policy is written, before we apply, we're to bring that to you for your approval. In this case, there are no, T there are no TSC funds being expended but that, is, that isn't what the policy says. The policy says we're to bring these grants before you. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, that's the reason that we're bringing them for you tonight. Mr. So the policy uh, has to be rewritten then. Policy has to be changed. Well, uh, we think uh, we would, would certainly advocate for that, uh, that particular policy to be changed just because we're pursuing grants all the time. And we'll continue to pursue grants if, 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 if we can meet with successes we have in, in uh, Mr. 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 Torres, if I, if I can I, uh, add that uh, I know that uh, Mr. Jim Holt and Irv Downing have done an enormous amount of, uh, they've spent a lot of time in putting this together, and, uh, but it, uses, it has to use TSC as a vehicle, and uh, I think it's a great, they've done a great job, and I think you know, we should move to approve this. Well, I don't have any yes, problems yes. with that. My, my concern is that the policy manual says differently. And we have to change that. That's my sure. point. I yes. have no questions sure. that you've done a good job with this. My question is that we need to look at the policy manual. And I think Alan and I have discussed that, that there's a lot of things that need to be um, that looked at, revisited, and, and make those changes. Uh, I have no questions, and I congratulate you on getting this grant. Thank you. Um, but, but I know that you agree with me that, and Alan, that we have to change the policy. And you change it because you need the flexibility. Right. Because sometimes the opportunities to apply for these grants are window short so close that you're going to miss a board meeting. So, you know, uh, Renee's comment is change it for the better to provide. So, yeah, so that we're not that. So you're not yeah. hamstringing the staff to have to come back and say, can we apply for this grant when you don't have time have to ask? Yeah, we don't, we don't want to lose that. I think no, that's a good point, and, and, and it's certainly yes. we need. That, that have to be. Uh, we no, no, we're okay for this. Will we rise to policy? Uh, as, it, as it revised to reflect what you've just discussed. Yeah. 
and we'll bring it to you for consideration. Yeah, because the, what the policy will still do is it'll still have to bring a grant in the name of TSC to this board, so this board will accept it and approve it. So and it gives it uh, a speedy uh, flexibility to get it going. And well, so we, yeah, sometimes you know if you've got six weeks between meetings, but you learn about the opportunity and the application is due before your next board meeting then if we follow the strictest sense of the policy, then we wouldn't apply for that grant because the board didn't grant the approval to go ahead and submit it. So this will provide greater flexibility. Well, what is the life of this, of this grant? <coughs> this is a, a one-year grant. In the one year, we must develop the curriculum for this, and we, we will then have the opportunity to install that curriculum at the technical level, at the certificate level, and then also in, in workforce continuing education. Yeah, and the other point I think that, that we also need to, to mention is that if this was a matching grant uh, and we, yeah. we didn't know about, about this, yes. then, then we would have a, a concern as far as TSC is concerned. Absolutely. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So I think that needs to be taken into account when you talk about rewriting the policies. You know, you don't, don't pre-commit without getting the authority to commit. Right. So with your permission then, we'll take it to the Business Affairs Partnership Committee or the, would that be appropriate? And we'll consider it there. First, before we bring it to your board, I move to approve. It's been uh, moved uh, to approve the uh, <coughs> the Texas Workforce Commission grant in the amount of two hundred three thousand one hundred sixty dollars by Mr. Torres, seconded by Mr. Gonzalez. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Mr. Chairman, the next item is an item with a similar situation. Uh, this item is consideration and possible action on acceptance of a grant award in the amount of $1,526,000 and approval to proceed with grant implementation on the grant from the Comptroller of Public Accounts for Distributed Energy Technology Program and to authorize the transfer of the grant to UTBTSC for implementation. This grant will fund installation of wind and solar power units at the ITEC Center. The system is anticipated to generate about 5% of ITEX energy once completed and is fully operational. And uh, this is another grant that was applied to and um, we were fortunate to receive on behalf of the efforts of Irv Downing and Jim Holt who can answer any questions that you may have on this. This item also re uh, requires approval. And I guess like, this, like the previous yes. grant, this, this does not require any matching No match. Funding. No. Okay. And, and, and we've been assured by the group that the solar panels that will be installed on the roof of the ITEC will not make any structural changes to that roof. We've assured Ms. Uh, and Mendes the other thing, Irv, I think that <laughs> this will require a lot of collecting of data. Um, can, can you explain what, how you're going to do this? Well, th these systems, I mean, you can imagine that we're going we're gonna to generate 5% of ITEC's power, and that's not much, no. okay? But the principal purpose of this is, if you look at it in concert with the first program, which is development of curriculum, it's really for teaching purposes. It also is a system that we'll have access to on the web that you can actually look at uh, and, and, and look at power outputs from both. It's a hybrid system, and it, can, it will be connected, and PUB has already given their approval to connect it back into their system. So the idea here is as much a teaching tool as it is a, a cost containment thing. So there, there are two elements to this, and it fits in with our renewable energy strategy that, that we've, we've talked to the board about as well, pushing that, that element of, of what we're trying to develop over there. And, and Irv, wasn't this somehow leveraged by the Go Green Center that was a previous grant? Yes, it, it, really what we used for, grant, for the grant on this was, the, for the match on this was the Go Green Center, because what we'll do is instruction out of that center right now, which we received other federal dollars from, from Housing and Urban Development on this. So again, we're, we're trying to build upon, we're trying to make a step stone on, on, on different activities that, that John Saucy and his team have done out at the business incubator area and, and with renewable energy on this. Yes. Another interesting impact of the Go Green Center, which again was funded previously through a grant, it teaches the community how to use energy in different ways, it models it, and this is also at ITEC. The other grant that was received in Cameron County was for $1.7 million. Yeah, I think it was $1.7 uh, million. And that person that wrote that grant got his training at our Go Green Center. Mm -hmm. And so then he went back and he said, okay, now I know how to do this. I'm going to try and get our own grant. So not only did it get us one, it also got one through this person's uh, efforts to uh, for Cameron County. 
There is some need for real time data though, because yeah. what you have in the community now is you have a lot of proposals that theoretically this is what will happen. Theoretically, yeah. this is what you will save. This is how much you will invest. Now you'll have an ability to say, you know, here's a real case uh, where right. we did this in this setting, and these are the real results. They're not theoretical results. And, and essentially, you're, 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 you're spending stimulus dollars as opposed to having to invest your own money in something that theoretically is supposed to work, but, but you know, we'll Might see not. if it works or not. So I think that's the good because there isn't any real-time data out there where you can actually demonstrate to somebody in real, you know, I can show you my meter or my bill to say this is what happened as opposed to, well, our figures indicate size of the building and these are, this is what theoretically should occur. Just as, again, as an aside, but another place we'll be able to do that is at the uh, Center for Early Childhood Education, where we use different building materials. And so we'll be able to look at energy consumption there, I mean, uh, energy smart materials, as compared to energy consumption square foot on, that, on the other parts. This, I think, would give you a better idea because it's tied directly to the meter, whereas the other one it is not. Good, it's not. It's just saying we use these construction methods that theoretically, you know, should insulate better, <coughs> have a better heat rating, or this and that. This is tied to the meter, so you'll actually be able to, to see whether you had net savings or not. And and with the new net metering policies that you know conceivably, uh, 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 you know, you, you'll be able to see it in, in, in real time on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. So could basis. we tie the other one to the meter? Well, if you make yes. the investment, you can. That one. We didn't, we didn't choose to, to do that. We, we chose to invest in the technology of construction, not in the technology of how you're going to provide the energy to light the building. And you can still come up with, I mean, you, if you look at the square footage, you know, what, you know, what it's costing you to, uh, you, you can come up with a good idea, but I guess Eddie's point is that it's not sure. exact, and, and it's not, and there's too many variables on usage and, and other stuff. And, we're, we're looking uh, at, a, at metering because all of those buildings are tied to the thermal plant, so the consumption is at the plant, but we can measure utilization at the building. That's what and I so was. that's one of the cost containment projects that Dr. Artebis mentioned that are gonna require a little bit of investment. And so we're looking at metering all of our buildings right now to understand which ones use uh, what amount of, of uh, energy. And that particular building is off the top of the list because we're very interested in learning whether the technology is working. Just curious, uh, any idea of what size windmill you're talking about? I'm not talking, not I mean, in terms of, no, 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 I'm not talking about in terms of height, I'm talking about in, in whether it's a, you know, kilovolt, kilowatt, or how, how big is it? Is it? It's 100 kilowatts. 100 kilowatts, okay. Sounds pretty big to me. Um, <laughs> you know, I, uh, Dr. Artemis, I, I, can't, I can't remember how, how tall it is. So we, I'm sorry, do we, we have not, uh, we have not voted on this and the discussion's been so long I forgot. So we need a motion then to, to approve. Move to approve. Thank you. That's the 1.526F, yes, approve the 1.526F. Yes, second. Number three. Okay, it's a motion by uh, Dr. Dr. Robles and I. Seconded by Ms. Prelove to approve the grant award of a million five hundred twenty-six thousand four hundred seventy-four dollars and eighty-eight cents. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. The motion carries. <laughs> the next item is consideration and possible action <coughs> on approval of payment to the UT system for participation <coughs> in the comprehensive property plan for fire and all of the perils and name windstorm and uh, flood coverage. And it's that time of the year, Mr. Campirano and Mr. Phil Dendy from the, the director of the UT System Office of Risk Management is here to present this item. Phil. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, thank you uh, for the opportunity again. I believe this is my fourth year to be here uh, and visit with you about the, uh, the property insurance program for uh, the UT System and uh, specifically for the Texas Southwest College in UT Brownsville and your participation in it. <laughs> there you go. Get up to the front here. There we go. There we go. Um, it is my fourth time here. Uh, we, we began this uh, in 1997, so this is the fourth time. I want to briefly go over uh, the property insurance program. We call it the Comprehensive Property Protection Plan. 
uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, TSC's estimated 2010 renewal, uh, the pricing and terms. Um, the, uh, the comprehensive uh, property protection plan includes two different programs. One is the fire and all of the perils program that includes uh, uh, basically all, all, uh, all risk uh, that, are, that are covered by the policies with the exception of named windstorm and flood. Uh, and then there is the named windstorm and flood program and underlying uh, national flood insurance program uh, policies <coughs> and Texas windstorm insurance association policies. Uh, the program does re uh, uh, include replacement cost coverage for all the real and business personal property. Uh, it also includes business, in business income, time element coverage. Uh, we began including uh, TSC in the program in April of 2007 and since then I'm happy to, uh, to report that uh, over the last four years, including the upcoming renewal, we estimate the savings that have been generated by your participation in this plan of about $1.8 million. Uh, one of the things that uh, when we began this was that uh, TSC agreed to use about half of the savings on property conservation measures. Uh, that is an ongoing uh, exercise. Uh, there was a, uh, we have done loss prevention property conservation surveys and we're working with Melba with regard to uh, how to uh, uh, prioritize the, the, uh, the use of those, of those savings. Uh, this is the, uh, the structure of the Fire and All Other Perils program. There is an institutional deductible of $250,000 uh, into a self-insurance retention uh, prior to getting into the commercial insurance, which has a $5 million deductible. Uh, the limits of that policy go all the way up to a $1 billion. Uh, with regard to payment into the, uh, the retention, that $5 million, if TSC were to, to have a loss, you'd have a $250,000 deductible, uh, and then the fund would pay uh, uh, the, uh, the balance of the loss up to $5 million, and then the commercial insurance policy would kick in above that. And then the institutions, all the, all, all the institutions pay back that loss within that retention over the next five-year period, uh, with all the institutions paying half the loss, and the institution that does suffer the loss paying the other half of that loss over a five-year period. The uh, named windstorm coverage uh, has a similar structure. We have underlying national flood and insurance program uh, policies, uh, which uh, and Texas wind policies that are the underlying level. Those are relatively low limit policies. There will be more on that uh, in just a little bit, uh, but those are relatively lo relatively low limit policies with relatively low deductibles. Then there's the institutional deductible, and then we get into a, into the fund uh, at the UT system. The payback is similar, only depending on the amount of the loss, it may result in issuing debt. If the loss can be paid from the funds that we have on hand, we, will handle it, we would handle it in a situation similar to how we handle the fire and all of the perils policy. And then on top of that is $100 million worth of commercial insurance uh, for named windstorm and flood. Uh, and that is, that is the program. We are currently in the market. Uh, right now, uh, and we will be binding this policy next week. We went to the market with an as-is program, but we're still negotiating price, terms, deductibles, all of those things, and we uh, expect to have more specifics on that in the near future. Uh, this chart basically shows uh, the, the reflection of the program over the last several years. Uh, the, the, the bar to the uh, far left, 2007, shows what uh, you would have been paying in 2007 had you gone with uh, the proposals that were offered. That's the, uh, the, the bottom part of that. And on top of that is the restated values based on the, the current increase in values that you've had since, uh, since you began in the program. Uh, you've increased your values uh, from about $153 million in property values, total insured values in 2007 to now it's about $244 million that are covered by the program. That's with all the new uh, buildings coming online. That's correct. Right. That's correct. And that, uh, this reflects uh, the, the difference between what you would have been paying uh, with commercial insurance, uh, with commercial insurance under your previous structure as opposed to what you're currently planning uh, to pay or what you are paying over the last three years. And then what we estimate in 2010 uh, we're estimating that participation in the UT system program about $276,000, uh, and then I think there will be another discussion a little bit later on with regard to the NFIP and TWIA policies uh, that uh, that uh, are also included there. So. 
Uh, be happy to uh, entertain any questions. The, yeah, just so, uh, and I couldn't see it. It didn't, it wasn't on my screen very well. We, well, I'm sorry, yeah, we stay. What then is the, uh, if we go, if we look at, uh, I guess, 2007, if we, or if we'd gone with commercial, I'm sorry, what is the total savings that we are, are going to, uh, that we save this year? Is that the million 145 that you talked about? If we applied the rate that you would have paid in 2007, the rate that you paid in 2007 to the values that you have in 2010, you, yeah. you would have been paying about 1.7, then about 1.75 million, yeah, yeah, 1.8 million dollars. More? No, total. Total. So what's the net, what's the net savings? Then? I'm sorry. Uh, it's well, we expect the total bill to be in 1. A, about 1.1. 1. 1. 1. So, so it's about, about six hundred thousand. Six hundred fifty thousand. Six hundred fifty thousand dollars savings That's between phenomenal. what you would have been paying and what we expect you to pay in 2010. And that includes both the property insurance program to the UT system program and the TWIA and NFIP policy. Were the, uh, uh, when Hurricane Ike uh, hit, uh, were the buildings, uh, uh, I guess all this, uh, the stuff in Gal all the medical school, the Galveston, those buildings, are, those, are these part of this program? It, it has been part of this program, yes. And it, so it, it then, still is part of the program. And yes. so all the losses they incurred, that uh, was, was, was paid out of this program, correct? It paid up to the limit. We had that $100 million worth yeah. of coverage that, that, that was paid by commercial insurance. Okay. What the uninsured loss is being covered by FEMA, and uh, there, there was also an appropriation of $150 million from the, from the state. From the legislature. Right. So what was the total loss, and do you, do you recall? The total loss is uh, in the neighborhood of uh, probably $800 million. And, and, and under the and, that, and that's just the that's the loss. That's not including mitigation, some other things that but, have to happen. But total loss, I'm sorry for for uh, for the UT uh, system insured property, right? The property that's in this program was 800 million for the folks at Galveston. The the Galveston loss in property was about 800 million. Okay. Uh, but the, the, but the, 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 the total loss, right. but the system loss is only what would be under the CPPP. Right. The rest of it would be covered. All of the rest of that would have been covered through FEMA, through the private insurance. Correct. So, so under the CPPP, then 50% of that loss remember, was covered by the system, it, and, and the rest is shared rest by all of us. us. So, so we we help pay for that too. And yeah. that well, actually, 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 you didn't. If that deductible <coughs> contention that 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 we had normally there would have been participation from the other institutions, but in this particular case, FEMA stepped ruled in and that, made that, up the that difference. We, that, that, okay. was a, that, that was a reimbursable deductible. Oh, okay. It took a while to get them to, to agree with us so, on that. So otherwise, if there had not been, you know, if it had not been a hurricane, if it had been a fire or something else then we would have, the rest of the institutions would have covered the rest of the, the other 50%. That's correct. And it's also important to, to know that, that the rates have, have remained relatively flat for the, uh, for, per uh, insured value over that time. There hasn't been any, uh, any, any dramatic increases. We did add last year uh, significant increases at UTMB, but they basically paid the bulk of any increase in, in premium because that's where the loss was. Now, that's where now the, that's where the value position on treating that loss <coughs> was, was that kind of like a, a policy issue, or is it like we'll do it this time and we'll, it's always going to be on a case by case no, the, basis? Their, or what? their their issue had to do with whether or not that was self insurance or whether or not it was a deductible. If it's a reimbursable deductible, that's going to be an ongoing uh, precedent that we believe has been set, and, and we were able to rely on other things that they had done in the past to make that case. Are the uh, amounts that are apportioned to all institutions under the umbrella the same, or do they differ if they are closer to the Gulf Coast than those that are not? The, the allocation methodology rates the institutions based on location, based on values in uh, uh, tier one wind zones, based on flood zones for the named wind, wind storm and flood program. Uh, the so, other program is based so Odessa on pa Odessa pays less than us because uh, the, they're not the, on the coast. On the windstorm, but yes. you know they're in Tornado Alley. They should be factured in. But, yeah, well, but, that's, but a, that's not that's not yeah. a name. I know, I that's know. A, that's I, a tornado. So that's yeah. covered under the other tower. Yeah. Okay. That's an age-old the, legislative argument. Cool. Being that, that we uh, we took some new buildings recently, we moved from 153 million 
property value to 244 million property value. What's the increase of, of premiums for, from then to, to now? Uh, the increase in, based on the rate? Ba based on the rate. Um, well, I think, I think that's reflected in what you paid uh, last year for the fire. And, and you paid $208,000 um, in uh, last year for participation in the program, and this year we're estimating if it's a flat rate based on the same rate with the increased values, it would be 276. It was a significant increase in values, but that reflects a flat rate. 260,000. 260, so about, right, about $70,000 would be that increase 70, based on the new. 70,000, it would be 208 to 276. I was a liberal arts guy, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I know better. Yeah, I am too. No, 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 you're a budget guy. <laughs> for the purpose of estimating, I'm, guy. <laughs> I'm sorry, for the purpose of estimating this, this premium, since we have not bound it yet, we just calculated the rate against total insured values that you paid last year just it just reflected that in this number. So that, hopefully, it'll be, hopefully it'll be better than that. <coughs> but you won't know until next week. Yes. We'll know. It, we've got an April first renewal. Okay. So. Well, this is fantastic, and I, I can remember when the when the premiums jumped so much, and I can remember being this Rudy really, yes. and getting the presentation from all the from our insurance company, 2007, and, and we were looking at a hundred percent increase in yeah. premiums. And I remember telling Dr. Garcia and Rosemary too is that there's got to be something out there, some kind of pooling or something that, and like manna from heaven, you guys appeared, and, uh, <laughs> uh, because that's a lot of money to us. I understand that Absolutely. you know maybe to UT Austin it's a drop in the bucket, for, but for us it's a, it's a lot of money, and it. it and Mr. Oliveira, just know. to reiterate that 2007 bar. If, if you insured those 300, the 246 million that, that Mr. Dendy indicated back then when you were buying insurance out in the commercial market, it would have cost you $1.8 million. Today you're still at 1.1. So it's almost at $700,000 savings uh, just, just in that one year value. And so over time you saw that the savings had accrued to $1.8 million. And so going forward, presumably, if you if you continue to add values, you continue to have savings on those add-ons as well. Plus, you're go ahead and, and reinvesting part of that back Absolutely. into Absolutely. That's right, and that's, that's, that's part of the program that, yeah, that you, you're, so you're, you're... You have an insurance yeah. fund. Uh, Melba is maintaining funds in a restricted yeah. insurance fund. So that net savings, you continue to budget the same amount as you did then, but you're, you're banking those dollars and actually saving them. You're spending 50% addressing maintenance issues, but the other 50% are staying in that form. Well, it's a it's a fantastic program, and and uh, we appreciate all that you do. It didn't seem like it was just a year ago. It just seems like yesterday that you were here, but uh, time flew this year for yes, us. Sir. I think, yeah. And Phil Dendy and his office work really hard to get all of our insurance bound. It's not just the TSC buildings, but it's also the UTB buildings. And so whatever savings accrue on the TSC side also accrue on the UTB side. And so we're very thankful for all that they do to uh, get us the kind of coverage at the best price possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much, and thanks for, for coming down. We have to, Mr. Uh, Chairman, the committee recommends approving payment to the UT system for participation in the Comprehensive Property Protection Plan in the amount not to exceed $276,000. I'll entertain a motion at this so moved. moved by Dr. Robles, seconded by Ms. Breedlove. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It's nice the to get, I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead. Nice to get some good, good, uh, Good uh, budget news. The next item is consideration and possible action on approval of the renewal of the windstorm hail property insurance. And so that's the TWIA part of the numbers that you see up on this slide. And so I'm going to ask Melba to come up. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Garcia. Uh, we have for you this evening the uh, underlying piece of, or one of the requirements of the CPP program is that we obtain insurance through the Texas Windstorm Insurance Association. In February of 2009, the district issued a request for proposals, and we reviewed those proposals and, and approved 
um, the proposal from R.N. Jones in March of 2009 with an option to extend for two years. Staff has been pleased with the service and the assistance that they have provided us, especially as we have added the new buildings and contents into the uh, existing policy as the new buildings have come online. This evening we're recommending the, extension, the renewal of the TWIA policy through R.N. Jones Agency um, for a policy period that goes from April 1st to April 1st. And I would like to note that this is a change from the previous policy that was a renewal of May 1 to May 1. What this allows the district to accomplish is an alignment of the two policies, being the UT system policy with the TWIA policy uh, to renew at the same time. So we would have the same renewal period. This does not cost the district anything. Um, as insurance rates you'll see are flat as compared to last year. So we will, we will um, terminate our existing policy on April 1, we'll reinstate and there is zero cost to the district as a result of that uh, change. We have increased, or TWIA I should state, has increased the limits per building from 4.1 million to 4.4 million. So we are able to obtain additional coverage um, on at least nine of our buildings that exceed that limit. We are keeping the 1% deductible per building per occurrence, and the proposed coverage has increased to $106.5 million. Um, as Mr. Dendy uh, indicated, we have over $244 million worth in values to insure. We're able to ob obtain insurance on $106.5 million through the TWIA uh, policy. The premium on that 106 is $869,108. Up here you have a comparison year over year of the change that has occurred in the policy. In fiscal year 10, we went from $89 million worth in value to $106.5 million in fiscal year 11, the difference being approximately 17.5 million, and I'd, I'd like to preface this by saying that the 17.5 is the limit that we're allowed to cover through TWIA. This isn't the total amount that uh, we have added to the policy, and you'll see that in the next slide, you'll see the total that we've actually added. The change in premium is $169,000. I'd also like to add that a portion of this premium increase um, is dependent on the rating on our art center that we're waiting on an inspection on, and uh, we're hopeful and believe that that, uh, that rating will, will come in much more favorable. So this is actually an, a maximum amount that we would pay. Um, should that rating come in where we're certainly hoping it will, we could reduce this by a, approximately $58,000. The new buildings that are being covered uh, as a result uh, in this new policy are the university classrooms, the library, the early childhood center, and the art center. The rec center, I would like to add, is, was added in last year's policy as, as it was already online um, at this time last year. Total building and contents added is over $55 million. Again, the limit on this through TWIA is the $17 million. The premium for the new buildings that are being added is $179,000. That concludes um, our presentation for this piece. Thank you. Yeah, you don't have choice, and yeah. you don't have a whole lot of choices on where to go get it either. So no, it's so right. You take it or leave it. So, uh, yeah, the, I move we approve the uh, renewal of the TWIA policy. My second. <laughs> been moved by Mr. Capitano, second by Ms. Breedlove. All those in favor? Aye. Motion carries. The final, the, go ahead. Excuse me. The final item covered uh, at the uh, Business Affairs Partnership Committee was the Resource Generation and Cost Containment Task Force presentation uh, that was presented earlier by Dr. Artebis. Uh, that completes <coughs> the report of the Business Affairs Partnership Committee, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask a question. Did, did I nap through this, but did we also do the winds, the, the flood policy? That was the windstorm. We do have the flood policies. Is it combined premium in, in that total? In the flood policies are issued separately. 
on the properties that are in the flood zone area, and you have um, the Port Mansfield property, you have the Raymondville property. Yeah, but in, in the breakdown a little while ago, we had, the, included, yeah. we had the, the National Flood Insurance and we had the TUIA coverages in. as well. And so we, all we did right now was the, the windstorm. It's in the, it's in the total. It's They're, in the total premium. Right, okay. the renewals are 2,000, 5,000 a piece. Okay. Thank you. The uh, next item on the agenda is the uh, a report from the audit committee. I'll call on Mr. Campidano to present this item. Well, there's really no report. What you have up before to consider is the adoption of the uh, uh, bylaws for the audit committee. We've, we tabled this at our last meeting to give everybody an That's opportunity right. to review them. Uh, all of the comments. Uh, um, that have been made have been incorporated into the changes. So what you have essentially is a final set of bylaws for consideration, action, and adoption by this uh, by the trustees. And um, uh, this will be the guiding uh, um, uh, policies for the uh, conduct of the audit committee going forward. Uh, we did add the provisions, um, if you recall from the last discussion, about working with the current uh, structure of the independent auditor that uh, currently is part of the UTTSC system and having the ability to work with them and having access to them. And so that did get incorporated into this. And that should be a big tool, I think, going forward for the committee. Uh, if there are no other comments on the uh, bylaws, I would certainly request and would move that uh, we approve them as presented. Second. Been moved by Mr. Capitano, seconded by Mr. Torres. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Thanks Capitano, for your hard work. For all and, your uh, work that you did on this, and and I think Mr. Torres too, and <coughs> Mr. Gonzalez, and Mr. Thank Gonzalez. Yeah. Next item on the agenda is a construction report. I'll call on Ms. Veronica Mendez to give that report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we begin our report with the Oliveira Library as mm -hmm. soon as it comes up on the screen. So you know, we've, uh, we've been working on the Oliveira Library for a couple months now, and we are on target for completion uh, to uh, have it available for the fall semester. You will see a picture on the screen. Okay, there you go. That's the special collections uh, view from the front door and the corridor. That will also be the uh, open lab that is being moved to the very first floor. You can see that we have all the walls and the, uh, the metal studs going up. We are working on infrastructure. Uh, a lot of work around the Leitner courtyard to bring the chill water piping that was part of this project as well. And so we continue to make progress. In addition, we have 128 parking spaces that are going to be completed uh, in about uh, three weeks. And so you see one of them right across from the entry drive to the art center has been completed. And just, we just want to complete the other one and punch it out and accept a substantial completion for it as well. So that's going to be a nice addition to parking. Also about parking on 19th Street, the former Brown Sister lots, if you may remember them, uh, that's the progress that we have there. We have 64 spaces going on, and they, they should be finished by the end of May. Of course, you had seen, we had seen some rain, some delays, but as soon as we get some dry weather, we move up and continue to progress. So that is going to be also a very good addition, close to MRC South and North. The athletic zone, you saw some of the pictures of our board members, to, uh, the tours that we had, and we'd certainly like to invite the rest of the board members uh, to come by and take a tour whenever possible. This is a view for the field itself, and you can see we are making progress with the underground utility going on, restrooms, uh, facilities, and uh, all of the clearing, and you'll see some of the areas back there for the bleacher pad um, and the uh, connections that so we will have uh, some of the drainage that we've created some of the sewer lines and water lines that are being installed there. So they continue to make progress on that project. Science and Technology Learning Center, those buildings are really taking shape now and you can see them as you drive by. This is the uh, connector between the north wing and the south wing, a view from uh, also from the interior, all of the mechanical uh, installation that is going on for the 12 labs that will be uh, the house of the biomedical research program. And um, that is uh, some of the support spaces for the laboratories that are going to be there as well. 
uh, a lot of infrastructure work also, connection to the chill water plant. So you see a lot of uh, dead end corridors outside of this space. So that's a view for the classroom <coughs> that takes in the south wing and uh, that's the uh, emergency response center wing and you'll see that the third story right there as you continue to move towards that. So we're um, on shape for completion in a year from, from now, 2011. That concludes my report. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, finally, the last item on the agenda is the President's report, and I'll call on Dr. Garcia to make that report. Thank you. Um, I, uh, we have, one of the most important things we do on this campus is to try to recruit new students. We've had many activities along the line of recruitment, and, and because it's the spring, you have an acceleration of recruitment and, uh, and field trips, and so we've been taking advantage um, of, uh, of getting these students on campus. We've taught some of them how to form into a scorpion, and uh, so when they come here, they will always be commemorated by a photograph of their class or classes shaped uh, into a scorpion in front of the student union uh, lawn. Uh, we also had, uh, so I'm going to go through with some of the recruitment activities that we've been um, hosting this semester. This is the uh, Latina Magazine student uh, seminar event. More than 200 high school and university students attended the Latina Magazine student seminar event. Panelists from the magazine shared their success stories in the fashion publication industry and emphasized the importance of their education. This event was well covered by local media, including Fox News, Televisa, and Univision on our university and, uh, and the event. We also had Texas Scorpion Day. Now in its eighth year, our Texas Scorpion Day brought a thousand seniors from BISD to our campus. They learned about campus life and student activities. They attended college and school preparations in the Arts Center and they attend and they participated in a program of study fair. We also had a visit from Los Fresnos ISD. We hosted more than 800 eighth grade students from Los Fresnos ISD to the university for a recruitment tour. They toured labs, they interacted with faculty, they learned about careers to include everything from forensics to physics, and they were inspired by the students that they met here. Special thanks to Rosemary Breedlove and Tudor Yulhorn, both former presidents of the UTV TSE Development Board for helping organize this event along with, of course, Carlos Tamayo and his staff uh, on campus. Uh, we also uh, hosted the Rio Grande Valley Regional Science and Engineering Fair once again. More than 500 junior high and high school students attended the 50th Annual Regional Science and Engineering Fair. It was so large this year that the junior division competition was held at the ITEC campus and the senior division competition was held on the Fort Brown campus. In addition to the students that took part in the event, their parents and more than 400 judges and volunteers also spent the day on campus, <coughs> helping to make this a very inspiring event for the student scientists. And finally, um, we had a College Goals Sunday. The Financial Aid Department took the lead in hosting this College Goals Sunday. It's a statewide initiative, and our campus actually ranked number one in the state of Texas for the number of volunteers that participated, <coughs> and number two in the state in the number of students that came to this uh, College Goals Sunday. There are just a few of the, these are just a few of the recruitment activities held during the year. Our enrollment management team, our student affairs division, and many faculty and staff do a wonderful job of raising awareness in the community, including our student ambassadors who are, are um, using and, uh, and used over and over again. They represent us so extraordinarily well. And so I just wanted to, to let you know that folks are very busy here uh, bringing uh, rounds of students uh, on our campus um, as much as possible. And we appreciate any other suggestions you might have. The eighth grade students was a suggestion uh, brought up at a development board meeting and by Tudor Yulhorn, picked up by Rosemary Breedlove, uh, and picked up quickly by Los Fresnos ISD. She has now gone to Port Isabel ISD and said, have we got a deal for you? And Port Isabel ISD is, uh, is uh, going to join us and so is Brownsville Independent 
school district. So one small kernel can produce great things. So thanks to all of the Student Affairs Division that are here tonight for all of your work and to the involvement of our board members. I appreciate it very much. Um, we've also had a student honored at a National Biomedical Research Conference. You met this young man, Jose Yongueras, uh, oh, yeah. a few years ago. He was Jose a student Pablo. in our Math and Science Academy. Um, he is now a junior. And he was one of eight undergraduate students in the nation honored with awards for developmental biological sciences research at the annual biomedical conference for minority students last fall. The event is the largest professional conference for the nation's biomedical and behavioral science students. It is designed to encourage underrepresented minority students to pursue advanced training in the biomedical and behavioral sciences fields including mathematics. More than 1,200 students participated in this contest uh, or in this competition. He won the prize, the first prize in the poster competition that represented, you know, when you say posters, you think of little posters. Well, the, the poster represented, reflected the research that they had done. And you remember his discussion with us a couple of years ago and, and, the, and the knowledge he had already. You can imagine what it, it must sound like now, two years hence. Well, others were impressed as well. Uh, Dr. Luis Colom is this student's uh, mentor and, and helped tremendously in launching his research effort. And so we congratulate Dr. Colom, we congratulate Jose Yongueras, his mother, who came and testified, I Elizabeth. believe, that day to you also. How could we and, forget? Uh, and everybody who worked so hard. So thank you, Dr. Colom. Congratulations. No. Uh, on the golf circuit, we had a very exciting moment for us. As you know, we have women's golf and men's golf. Our former Scorpion golfer, April Martinez, yes. that you all may remember, it's also the Duramed has Tour, yeah. earned her tour card and qualified for the Duramed Futures Tour. Tour for the Ladies Professional Golf Association. Um, April received her bachelor's degree from us last May after four years on the Scorpion Golf Program. During her athletic career here, she qualified for the national tournaments twice. The Duramed Tour is a training ground for the Ladies Professional Golf Association. <laughs> April's goal is to win as much money as she can <laughs> while she works to qualify for the LPGA Tour. While she knows she'll encounter fierce competition, her native, this native strength is off the tee. She actually is hitting longer drives than most women than most uh, men with the men's too. clubs she <laughs> likes to use. Uh, she was a runner up at the NAI National Tournament Long Drive oh, Contest and continues to develop her skills on her short game and on the green. Sounds like I know golf. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> I'm impressed. What does all that mean, Dr. Garcia? <laughs> she can shoot with men's clubs in a long, a long way. Uh, congratulations. I'm very proud. Uh, I, we're going to have our own. Remember the young lady who was the first Hispanic? I'm going to forget her name right now. Linda? Nan or? Nancy Lopez. Nancy you? Lopez. We're going to have our own uh, our April yeah. Martinez uh, here <laughs> on, uh, from the, on, the, on the ladies' uh, professional tour. The last uh, announcement is simply uh, to, uh, to, to thank all of you who helped us um, in the spring lecture series. We hosted uh, Catherine Fuller, who is the chair of the Ford Foundation and the former president and chief executive officer of the World Wildlife Fund. She presented a, a, pre a speech on challenges to conservation in the natural world. Um, she has a very rich background. Um, she is an attorney. Uh, who has spent her entire career working uh, on behalf of the preservation of wildlife around the world. Um, she's also been a special advisor to the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. Her lecture focused on the challenges in conservation world. We had many students there that night, many members of the community, many members of the environmental community and conservation community. Um, and <coughs> we had a great, very uh, informative, thought-provoking uh, question and answer period uh, afterwards. Our fall Distinguished Lecture Series is already booked. Uh, Blake Mykoski, who is the founder of Tom's Shoes and innovator of the One for One program, will speak on our campus October the 11th, so mark the date. And that concludes, sir.
president's report. Okay, you, you, Chester and I are baffled here. What are Tom's shoes? Uh, Mrs. Breedlove is very familiar no, with this, it. This young man actually started out at SMU, and he is a very entrepreneur. If you buy a pair of shoes, He'll send a pair of shoes to South America to children. That oh, are okay, in yes. Now, now I, I wasn't sure. Okay, I'm yeah. Absolutely done when you see it. Wow. Well, ask your daughter. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Tom McCann no, shoes. No, 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 ask your no. daughter if if sure. she was wearing okay. shoes. Was it your yes. daughter that said, "I know what Tom's shoes yes, are"? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, it's bad. Okay. He started out at SMU, and while he was a freshman, he was doing other people's laundry. And I mean, he just, he just exploded. Maybe he can, all, he just an entrepreneur doing everything that, that every, anybody needed. Maybe you can bring some to Cameron Park. Yeah. yeah. That'd great. be great, that'd be great. Well, fantastic. Our next Sorry, proposed Patrick. meeting date is uh, Thursday, April uh, 22nd, and we moved the May meeting to Monday, May the 17th, so we can canvass uh, uh, the votes from the elections. So. We, uh, we, we will stand uh, adjourned, I guess, until April 22nd. Thank you. All right.